Okay, hi everyone. It is about 7 a.m. on Saturday morning, and uh, I know it's not that time for you guys, but that's when I'm recording this. I've got my windows open at home um, and a very angry crow yelling outside, so apologies if you hear some ambient sounds. Um, we're going to finish up the dermatology section that we started on Thursday. Apologies for not getting through it all, but there's a lot of information here, and you know, uh, you probably have guessed that itchy dogs, itchy cats, dermatology in general is a pretty big deal in the small animal clinical practice. Um, we do see some dermatologic issues in our um, exotics as well, um, especially rabbits, guinea pigs, a um, little bit in ferrets, and some rats and mice as well. So I'll talk about that when we get to those sections. Um, Generally with birds, um, we don't tend to see a ton of dermatologic issues with the exception of feather picking, which is typically more behavioral and um, kind of mental, if you will, than an actual problem with the skin or feathers. It's usually secondary to um, keeping birds in small cages for their lives where they're just not generally meant to be. So uh, soapbox aside, <laughs> we'll move on to the dermatology section. We're going to continue with this common dermatopathies, and I covered a lot of this already in class, so I'm just going to kind of zip through these first few slides um, on atopy again. So just as a reminder, atopy um, is also called atopic dermatitis, allergic inhalant dermatitis, because typically these patients are reacting to allergens in the environment that they are inhaling, like pollens and dust and that sort of thing. Some of our patients will have contact allergies as well. Um, we'll see that especially with dogs who have any allergies to grass. Um, they'll be, and that's one of the reasons why their feet get so itchy is because they're in contact with the allergens, either the grass or the pollen or the dust in our homes. Um, just, you know, we can't get rid of it all, no matter how clean we uh, keep our homes. So. All that stuff is in the environment. Um, so typically these patients are going to be itchy on their uh, feet and their abdomen, and their bellies, um, and very, very often we have, sometimes as a solo clinical sign, chronic ear infections. So, you know, ear infections can certainly happen as a occasional issue with some patients, but those dogs and cats that get chronic ear infections, um, they are actually allergy dogs. They're dogs with atopic dermatitis and they should be treated as such. Um, so that's something that, you know, if you have a little dog coming in uh, frequently for ear infections, um, that's something your veterinarian will probably start to talk about with those clients. And I've gotten to the point now where the first time we see a dog with an ear infection, I say, okay, we don't know how this is going to go, but a lot of dogs get chronic ear infections. We have a hard time getting a handle on these. So be forewarned, owners, this might be what we're dealing with. I talked a little bit about intradermal skin testing as kind of the gold standard for diagnosing what our patients are allergic to. Um, but like I said last week, it's, it's possible that clients won't be excited about this procedure or um, won't have the funds for this procedure. And so sometimes we have to kind of make assumptions about what our patients are allergic to. Um, the other thing that we want to try and rule out is diet as a source of the allergen. And it's something that we're seeing more and more dogs and cats um, and even ferrets start to show signs of dietary intolerance or allergy to a particular ingredient in the food. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, we talked about the sensitization injections already, so I'm going to skip over that. Um, oh, just to, before we get into diet trials, just to expand on our atopy treatment, I mentioned antihistamines and steroids um, last week, and I also, as we were closing up, I talked about Apoquel and Cytopoint, and these are new drugs um, that have shown a lot of promise in particular with targeting the itch. These drugs are not drugs that reverse allergy, um, you know, what the allergy is doing in the body necessarily, but it does 
disrupt the itch cycle, which really means a better quality of life for our patients. And uh, sometimes, you know, that's really all we need because a lot of times what's happening is that the itchiness is triggering a lot of trauma to the skin and then that's setting up for skin infections and things like that. So that's the great thing about Apoquel and Cytopoint. Cytopoint is really cool. Cytopoint is, is an antibody. It's a monoclonal antibody, which means it's a, a single type of antibody that's injected into the patient and it neutralizes a cytokine. And remember that cytokines are like little chemical messengers. They're little text messages from one cell to another. And it gets in the middle of that cycle and neutralizes a cytokine that is supposed to tell the, in the, the nervous system that the patient is itchy in a particular location. Well, the cytopoint goes, the antibody goes to that cytokine and basically binds it up so it can't talk to the nervous system and then the uh, itch signal is not sent to the brain, so then the patient isn't itchy. It's pretty cool. Again, these are drugs. We haven't seen the, what the long-term effects of these drugs are yet. Um, so, you know, so I would always recommend proceeding with caution with any kind of new medication, but I think they are showing a lot of really amazing promise for our patients and keeping them comfortable. So let's talk about food allergy and the idea of hypoallergenic diets. So food allergy gets a lot of press. A lot of people talk about allergy to particular things in the patient's food. And um, one of the things that gets blamed the most often is grains. Um, the truth of the matter is that most of the time, if a dog or a cat or a ferret um, is allergic to something in their diet, it is due to the protein source and not necessarily the carbohydrate source. Now there are exceptions to that rule, but if we're talking big, you know, big picture here, most of the time our patients are allergic to the protein. And the protein is usually coming from animal meat, um, which is where it should come from for our carnivorous dogs and cats. Um, so, you know, as a side effect of, of breeding the way that we do, selective breeding, I think probably we have inadvertently selected for dogs and cats that have um, sensitivities to particular types of proteins. And that's just something that happens when you do selective breeding and you don't know what each gene function is going to be. Um, what's kind of interesting is that it's not necessarily a new diet that triggers the allergy symptoms in these dogs and cats. A lot of times they've been eating the same diet for a very long time and then over time develop a sensitivity to it. Um, that's something that with a lot of allergies happens but it's not like an immediate I've never seen this before and now my body's going to react to it it's I've seen this for years and years and years and I've been building up a sensitivity to it that kind of tips over um, into clinical signs so clients that say oh I've been feeding you know this dog this dog food for six years to my dog and he's never had a problem with it before well it doesn't mean that he's not having a problem with it now um, it can be really difficult to make this diagnosis because um, food allergies mimic allergic inhalant dermatitis as well. And then all sorts of the other things that we need to rule out like uh, parasites and infections and all those kinds of things we need to rule out before we finally settle on food allergies. So it can be quite a diff difficult diagnosis to make. Um, whenever I am talking to clients that I suspect their their pet has some kind of allergy, whether it's um, inhalant or food or whatever, I always start my conversation with this is going to take a long time to figure out. And um, I think it's really important for us as veterinary professionals to communicate with our clients that this is not a simple solution. This isn't just a, you know, an injection and you walk away, even though we've got side point now. Um, you know, those patients still need to be managed and it can take a long time to get a handle on what's going on with a pet. So that's really important, and that's part of the technician's job, too, is to kind of reiterate what the veterinarian is saying um, as far as the duration, you know, duration of time to get this under control may be quite long, and it can get frustrating, and, you know, we understand we want to fix your pet as soon as possible, um, but sometimes this does take time. So the way that we manage a food allergy is we're going to try what's called a hypoallergenic diet trial, and there's a couple of different ways to do that. First of all, if you're going to do a dietary trial, you need a couple of really important things. The first one is dedicated owners. 
you need owners that are willing and able to feed a particular diet and only that particular diet um, for a period of about two to three months. So owners need to be really honest and you encourage them to be really honest. Do you think that you can do this? So people with toddlers, it's really almost impossible to try a dietary trial um, because little kids throw food on the floor and one of the great things about having a dog is that you get to let them clean it up <laughs> instead of having to do it yourself. So that can be really challenging. Um, you know, people who have kids in general, depending on how old the kids are and how much they understand that the dog really needs to eat just one thing, people love to give dogs treats and table food and things like that. So, um, you know, and, and honestly, I've had sometimes had the biggest problems with um, the uh, owner's parents, the human owner's parents, uh, grandma and grandpa, if you will, um, oftentimes feel bad for the dog if he just has to eat one kind of food and can't get other types of things. And sometimes they are a little too indulgent, as grandparents like to be. So, you know, if I have had lots of situations where it can be a challenge for those owners. And you just, you know, don't don't um, approach it with any sort of judgment. Just say, do you think we would be able to do this? Because a lot of people can't. Um, and make it okay for them to say, you know what? No, I can't. I can't do this. This is not going to work for my family. Um, so that's number one, dedication and ability to do that. Then you need to select a diet. Now there's a lot of different ways that we can approach dietary trial. One is to use, if you look over on the left side of the screen, it says selected protein on this Royal Canaan diet. And it says under that adult PR. And what that stands for in Royal Canaan um, speak is P um, and rabbit. So the uh, protein source in this particular diet is rabbit and the carbohydrate source is pea, um, like green peas. And the reason um, this is a, called a selected protein diet is in this instance, what we're trying to do is introduce this dog to a protein and uh, in this case also a carbohydrate source that it's unlikely to have seen before. Most people in America do not eat rabbit as a general staple in their diet and so the majority of our dogs, um, unless they hunt in the backyard, um, have not actually eaten rabbit meat. And so trying a brand new protein um, to see if that dog is, uh, you know, can alleviate the sensitivity to whatever protein he's currently eating can be really effective. Now, there's a problem with selected protein diets these days. Um, they first were the only way we had to treat allergies um, back in the, let's see, I was in school in the 2000s, so it was before then, I would say probably 1990s, 80s and 90s. Um, selected protein diets were the only ones. And the first one to come out was lamb, lamb and rice. Well, I think you guys know now, lamb and rice is all over every grocery store and pet food supply shelf. There, You can't um, avoid lamb now in dog food. Um, and then so we started being creative, uh, the veterinary community started being creative with different types of protein sources. Um, for a while, the Ims Yukonuba company had a diet that was uh, made from kangaroo and oat, and that was a diet that they could not use in Australia because kangaroo is eaten relatively frequently in Australia and makes its way into dog foods relatively relatively frequently. And so that would be a diet that a United States dog would never have seen the um, protein source for sure. Um, so that's sort of what started to happen. We used um, uh, buffalo was one that was uh, uh, kind of in vogue for a while. Um, than different types of fish. And the unfortunate thing is that because humans like to share their table food with their dogs, that reduces the number of novel proteins that these dogs haven't had before. And then again, other food companies that are not necessarily making prescription diets are creating um, foods that have, you know, buffalo and salmon and all that kind of stuff that you can just get up off the shelf. And so a lot of times these selected proteins or novel protein diets um, have already been used. And then we also have um, what we call hydrolyzed diet. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, the other thing you need is time. You need about at least 8 to 12 weeks, about 2 to 3 months, to figure out if the patient is actually responding to the diet or not. So during this time, this 8 to 12 weeks, we definitely want uh, the patient to have no treats unless they are uh, prescription diet treats that are made from um, the kind of food that we're feeding. Um, definitely no human food. Really nothing but this novel protein or carbohydrate diet or a hydrolyzed diet. And that's the picture here, the ZD. 
It's one of the Hill's prescription diets. Um, what happens in the hydrolyzed diets is the way that they process the food, when the animal digests it, the protein molecules get broken down into such small uh, molecules that the immune system can't recognize it. So the reason that our patients are having an allergic reaction to the food is that the body has decided to create antibodies. Um, usually we're going to see like IgA and IgE antibodies to the proteins um, that have been created as a result of digestion. And then that starts an antigen antibody complex and that starts this whole cascade that leads to pruritus and uh, erythema on the skin. So in the hydrolyzed diet um, plan, what's happening is that those protein molecules get broken down into unrecognizable par particles. And so the immune system just lets them go through and the dog can use that protein like it can use, um, you know, could use protein before, but the immune system is not responding. We do not have antibodies to those protein molecules. And generally they don't create new ones, which is great. So hydrolyzed diets have become very, very helpful in treating dogs and cats with uh, food allergies um, because we don't have to worry about novel proteins having been eaten before by the dog. So it's kind of a good thing. So although we spend a lot of time dealing with allergies in practice, skin diseases, are more than just allergies. So we're going to talk about some of our other dermatopathies. Dermatopathy means something is wrong with the skin. So dermatophytosis. Dermatophytosis, aka ringworm. Just realized that ringworm is not on the slide, but that's okay because I prefer to call it dermatophytosis. Um, because I think ringworm is a, a terrible name for this disease. <laughs> um, it is not a worm. And in a, our patients, it does not tend to always form a ring like it does in humans. Okay, so the important thing to note about dermatophytosis or ringworm is that it is a superficial fungal infection. So not a worm, it's a fungus. And it's specifically an infection of the hair. It's, it can cause and will cause uh, skin irritation, but the primary part of the uh, patient that's infected is the hair, and that's what we really need to focus on when we're treating these guys. Downside to dermatophytosis is, of course, it's zoonotic, and so um, you, as a veterinary professional, will be at risk for getting this. The lucky thing is that humans generally tend to respond really nicely to um, shampoos or um, topical ointments. Um, and we can clear it up pretty quickly on ourselves. So it's not a huge deal in the human world, but with our dogs and cats, they don't respond as nicely to the topical treatments. They have a lot thicker hair than we do. Um, and then we also have carrier states where dogs and cats can have ringworm on their hair and not show clinical signs. And so they can be a little bit more difficult to treat. Uh, we are gonna treat these guys with um, oral antifungal medications, and um, you see right over on the right side of the screen, itraconazole. Itraconazole tends to be one of the more commonly used oral medications. Um, sometimes we have to have it compounded for cats, although there's a, a new liquid formula that's just come out for cats, which is wonderful because it's hard to dose these guys because they're small in body weight, um, and cats are very sensitive to um, some of the other antifungals that are out there. So itraconazole tends to work pretty well for them. You can see on this black and white cat, this little tuxie cat that's on the screen, has some classic round ring-shaped lesions. Um, but I'll show you some pictures in a second that you know show that they can, they don't always do that. And actually they mostly don't do that. See this little Jack Russell Terrier on the right side of the screen and his whole little face is just um, infected with uh, dermatophytosis and it's clearly not in a ring. Um, and it's causing a lot of skin erythema, crusting. Um, you can see around his uh, periorbital region around his eyes, he's got, you know, kind of um, ulceration as well. So it can be pretty difficult um, for them to, to manage as far as uh, cause a lot of irritation and discomfort. Over on the left side of the screen, you'll see lime sulfur dip. And there may be some of you guys in the class who've had to do this to your patients, and you'll know how terrible it is. 
Um, we got to the point in my last practice where we just started sending this stuff home with owners and teaching them how to do it because it, it smells like sulfur, so it smells like rotten eggs in your hospital. Um, and that's very stressful for the patients who are coming in, and it's pretty stressful for the uh, employees because that smell lingers in the air for like a day or two. So um, basically this uh, lime sulfur dip is diluted and then applied to the patient um, and allowed to dry. You don't towel it off, you don't rinse it off, you allow it to dry, and it does a really good job of killing the dermatophytosis. Um, but it, it stinks to high heaven. It's terrible. So we're going to diagnose dermatophytosis. We can do it a couple of different ways. The kind of gold standard and the best way to diagnose it is with something called a fungal culture. And you can see these little bottles over on the right side of the screen. Um, the uh, yellow one with the white cap, that is a, a DTM um, or dermatophytosis medium uh, bottle that has no sample on it yet. It comes in this little jar sometimes or sometimes like a little, um, like a Petri dish size or shaped um, uh, unit, <laughs> and uh, you place some hair uh, directly onto the medium, and then you need to wait at least 10 days, but ideally up to 21 days if you're um, looking for a negative result um, on your patient. But the cool thing about the DTM is that most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, if you have dermatophyte, um, it will actually turn that medium red and so that's kind of a, an indicator that you've got a positive result. You can see the cat here um, has a couple of erythemic lesions on the head. They're kind of circular in shape, so that does look like a traditional ringworm lesion. And then that other picture we have down at the bottom, that's gross human. Um, but you can see that's what a ringworm lesion will look like in a human. So sometimes we see that in our patients. Um, you can also, for some species of dermatophyte, you can see them under a black light or a woods lamp. And so most clinics will have um, a woods lamp uh, on their, you know, in their building somewhere. And what you do is you turn out all the lights. And you turn on the black light, the woods lamp, and you see if your little patient fluoresces. Now, Sometimes just regular scale and dandruff will fluoresce. So you have to look really closely. Um, it's the hairs that you're looking for. So you want to see that the actual hairs of the patient are fluorescing, not just the, um, you know, the little flecks. Um, in the center here, you can see in this little, in this cat who's got uh, dermatophytosis on the hairs of his nose, you can see those individual hairs are just lighting up. Um, the other two aren't as easy to see, but those are hairs that are lighting up. It's not flakiness, it's not scale, um, you know, so that's important when you're utilizing that tool um, to not overdiagnose. But if you see that, then you've got a pretty good chance you're dealing with ringworm. Um, the other issue with this is that there are species that don't fluoresce. So a negative test doesn't mean that the patient is without ringworm. So you can do a couple other things. Um, of course, you can do a culture. You can also pluck a few hairs if there's a lesion. Um, and you want to pluck a few hairs around the outside edge of the lesion and place that on a microscope slide with some potassium hydroxide or KOH. And that's um, something every clinic should have in its uh, possession. And you put the KOH on, uh, just a drop of that on with the hair, and then you look at it under the microscope. And normal hair should look like the picture at the top. You should have a nice smooth cuticle. Um, if it's a pigmented hair, you'll have some pigment, you'll have some melanin in the center like you see here. And then on the bottom, dermatophytosis will look sort of like a rotted log is the analogy people use to describe it. You can see the cuticle is not smooth. And actually, if you look closely, those little kind of that, that irregular area on the surface of the hair there, that's the dermatophyte. That's the fungus that's growing on the hair. Um, so these will look very unhealthy under the microscope. And you can see if you look in the right corner of the bottom picture, there's a, like a skinny piece of hair there that looks normal. So you'll have a combination very often of normal and abnormal looking hairs if you look at it under the microscope. That's a really useful diagnostic test to do that'll get you some answers very quickly.
so if we do culture it, um, which again, gold standard should do that, um, you can do it a couple of different ways. One, you can pull hairs on the edge of a lesion. Um, it's going to be important to do that. You don't want to, there's probably not going to be many hairs on the inside of the lesion, but you want to pull it hairs from the edge of the lesion um, and stick those directly on the dermatophyte plate. And you can see here's another version of the dermatophyte uh, that's different than the little jars I showed you before. Now, if you have a patient that you think is a carrier, or let's say a human in the family has ringworm lesions, but no known contact with, um, you know, anyone else who has ringworm lesions, what you can do is, is what's going on in the picture all the way to the right is take a clean toothbrush, brand new toothbrush, um, which you should have on stock because you're going to send those home with patients after dental profies, and you're going to brush the whole patient, or you're going to brush the lesion, you're going to collect some hairs that way, and then you put those hairs directly on the dermatophyte medium, test medium, um, DTM plates, and then you'll get uh, a result 10 to 21 days later. So that's a pretty cool thing. And it's gentle. You know, they don't mind being brushed with a little toothbrush. So moving on to our next topic. This is pyoderma. Pyoderma is very, very common as well. It's a bacterial skin infection. So pyo means pus or, you know, that's when our white blood cells um, kind of congregate in an area. And then derma is dermis or skin. Um, you can also have pyoderma um, in skin folds. It's called skin fold dermatitis. Um, and that's really common in breeds like bulldogs and um, oh, pugs, anybody with a brachycephalic squishy face and wrinkles. Um, those guys are going to have uh, some pretty significant likelihood of getting skin fold pyoderma. But for the rest of the animals, um, we're going to get pyoderma often on the abdomen or the, the ventral abdomen. Um, and usually there it'll look like it'll be pustular, um, you know, lots of little pimples. Um, you may see it in the tail fold or the peri perivulvar area um, in overweight animals. Um, this little puppy in this picture, this little Weimaraner puppy, has um, a pyoderma known as puppy strangles, and this is a staph infection. Um, and uh, it's a little different than what you're going to see. It's a little more dramatic than what you're typically going to see, but you can see pyoderma anywhere in the body. It causes erythema and oftentimes thickening of the skin. It's very often pruritic, uh, and alopecia may develop as well, especially if they're scratching a lot. So that's something that you'll see quite an awful lot. Um, the most common place, again, you'll see it is on the abdomen with the pustules, um, and you'll see it very often in puppies. They get a little puppy pyoderma very commonly. It typically responds very nicely to antibiotics. Most of these animals, or sorry, some of these animals will also have atopic dermatitis, and that's the reason why they have pyoderma. So the pyoderma may be secondary. Another common skin condition is seborrhea. And seborrhea is a keratin disorder. So remember back when we talked at the very beginning of the class how we have in the epidermal uh, tissue layer, we have the basal cells that are the brand new cells. And as they age, they move uh, towards the surface of the skin and um, become more flattened. And then eventually when they get up into um, the cornified layer, they're basically you know keratin plus dead cells. And so that's the normal progression takes about three weeks. Um, if we have any disruption in that normal turnover of cells, if we're not sloughing uh, skin cells normally, if that keratin is somehow um, disrupted in its production in normal ways, if you have an excess of oily secretion or sebum, um, then that may trap more of those cells on top of the surface of the skin. And so this is gonna disrupt the normal turnover, that three week turnover of skin cells. Um, and so what happens is it looks like the skin is producing large amounts of scale and crust. What's happening really is that it's hanging on to the scale, it's hanging on to those skin cells longer than it should. Um, oftentimes there's a lot of sebum or oil produced in these patients, and so they may um, be kind of greasy feeling, and they may also smell bad um, because we're trapping bacteria and that's creating uh, odor on the skin. Um, these guys typically respond really nicely to a uh, shampoo that helps to flush out the hair follicles and, and get some of that sebum out, and then will help to loosen and remove the scale. Um, so this is generally treated with um, shampoos topically, 
And then sometimes we'll add in um, essential fatty acids and things like that to improve hair coat and skin quality. Now some of our patients will develop something called a lick granuloma. And what happens is a patient will lick chronically at one particular area until the hair is lost and then we have an ulcer develop. And then if that continues to be chronic, um, we can get thickening of the skin and um, you know just basically uh, some pain and sort of a, a cyclical problem because once they create a sore, they're going to want to lick it because that helps make it feel a little bit better in the meantime and then they're making it worse and it's just this bad cycle. Um, there's a lot of controversy over what causes lick granulomas. I think it's probably multifactorial. Um, dermatologists generally think that they, there's an allergy uh, that triggers it, you know, a uh, pruritic response and they're trying to um, alleviate that. Um, a lot of behaviorists feel like it may be uh, an OCD type response um, where the patients are kind of licking because it helps to satisfy some sensation in the brain. Um, you know, sort of like, you know, there's some humans who pull hair um, and that helps to make them feel better in the moment. Um, and then there are um, some who feel like maybe there's discomfort and pain in that location. And uh, then there's the rest of us who feel like probably it's some combination of all of those things. Um, so it's something to try and, if you can get to the bottom of when you're patient, try and figure out what's causing it. It's hard sometimes to figure it out because usually by the time we see them, they've been going on for a while and they look like um, they do in this uh, dirty Samoyed here in this picture. So it looks pretty freaked out. Well, that's kind of your very classic, classic serious looking lick granuloma. Um, the carpus and the tarsus are the most common areas for this, um, and treatment is really difficult. Uh, some folks will put an e-collar on, and you know that definitely works to prevent them from getting at it, um, but it's not really getting at the underlying problem. It's not addressing the, the pain, allergic, or behavioral um, portions of this disease. Um, trying behavior modification, sometimes medications to uh, alleviate anxiety or CD type behaviors is helpful. Um, sometimes using antipyritic medications like steroids can be helpful. Um, antibiotics often are used because they do have a superficial infection on top of that um, granuloma. And then more recently, um, cold laser therapy has been shown to be helpful um, in using photobiomodulation to um, alleviate the inflammation in that area. So Basically, a, a laser is using light energy to um, change what's happening in the skin and the subcutaneous tissue to reduce inflammation. We reduce inflammation, we reduce itch, we reduce pain, and then the patient starts to feel better. So we're seeing a lot of that used these days too. Here's another image um, on the distal uh, tarsus, and this patient is not um, quite as serious as that Samoyed we saw in the previous picture, but you see the erythema, the alopecia, um, we've got a little bit of ulceration on the surface, um, and some thickening. You can kind of appreciate that it's really thickened around there. The skin really gets firm and thick and, um, in response to the chronic trauma from the licking. Now, if you see golden retrievers in your practice, um, which I hope you do, unless you're a cat practice, that wouldn't make sense, um, then you're gonna see hot spots. And we'll see them in other breeds as well, but they're kind of, you know, golden retrievers are sort of the poster children for atopy in general, um, but especially for hot spots, they're really good at getting these. So um, the uh, medical term is acute traumatic dermatitis or acute moist dermatitis. Um, Pyotraumatic dermatitis uh, is another thing that you can call it. Um, but what you're going to tell owners it's called is a hot spot because that's way easier to think about. And basically what happens is some kind of skin irritation leads to that patient scratching. Um, when the surface of the skin is disrupted, serum and sebum from the uh, skin is going to start to ooze. And then that's going to be a cycle of itching, scratching, itching, scratching, trauma to the skin, bacteria, 
infection, and pretty soon, and literally in a matter of days, you're going to go from a dog that's just itchy to a dog that has a massive sore somewhere. Now this, you can see in this sweet golden, um, this hot spot is uh, ventral to the right ear, and it basically takes up the right side of the, the head there. Um, and that's probably the most common location you're going to see them. And they're usually due to the fact that this dog probably has an ear infection that started it. This dog has atopic dermatitis and uh, started scratching the ear, caused some trauma under the ear, kept scratching because it kept itching. Um, and then, you know, here we have a couple days later, we've got this pretty traumatic uh, lesion. This is really painful. Um, as you can see, look at that erythema. Um, incredibly just uncomfortable, these guys. Um, this hair has been shaved, but before they shave the hair, it'll be kind of like a, a thick mat with gooey stuff. It's really gross and they stink. You're going to see them a lot, though, and technicians to the rescue. So whenever I see a hot spot, I talk to the owner about what we're going to do, and then I hand them over to you guys because you guys are the ones who take care of this. So you're going to uh, clip and clean that area, so you're going to shave it up. Sometimes it's painful, though, so sometimes we have to sedate them um, if it's really uncomfortable. Um, and then you're going to clean it up with some nice mobile sand and saline. Do not use alcohol on these. Very painful. Um, and then we're going to apply medications topically. Um, I really like to use an over-the-counter product um, called Dome Boros. That's an astringent, so it kind of dries the area up. Helps to reduce the itch as well. It's pretty nice. Um, and very often these guys also get a short course of steroids to help them stop itching. I'm very pro-steroid in this situation. Um, and then antibiotics almost always because they usually have a pretty good pyoderma going on there as well. Okay, so let's talk about external parasites. I know those of you guys in 116 and 216 have covered external parasites, so hopefully this is old news for you, but let's just uh, review. So the most common dermatologic problem is uh, that. Gross, gross flea. Um, this is flea allergy dermatitis. You'll see it often in the literature noted, uh, uh, reported as FAD, F-A-D. And um, this is probably the most common dermatological problem we see in the United States. Um, maybe not in Minnesota, because we're lucky we get these hard winters that kill fleas outside. Um, but if you have fleas in your house, they will, they will survive the winter. And oh, I'm itchy just looking at that thing. Um, so what happens is the, the pet has an allergic reaction to the flea bite um, when the flea injects its saliva. And they are incredibly itchy. Um, and just miserable. Look at this poor little Aussie here with hardly any hair um, from about halfway down his body caudally. Um, this is one of the most itchy things that patients will have is flea allergy dermatitis. Um, this is treated with flea control and luckily we have a lot of really good flea controls out there. We have um, oral medications that will kill fleas in 24 hours like Capstar. We have topical medications like Frontline and Revolution. Um, but we also have to kill these fleas in the house. And the important thing to tell the owners is that, oh, the flea came back, is that even if you don't see fleas on the patient, we should treat the patient. Um, and, and a lot of veterinarians, if they see an itchy patient, the first thing they're going to do is apply um, or administer another type of flea control. Um, because a lot of times, and especially in cats, you don't see fleas. They groom them off. Um, after they get bit, they get bit, they itch, they groom off the flea. Um, fleas don't spend their entire life cycle on the patient, so a lot of times you may not see them, but they're probably in the house. And if they're not jumping on the people and biting them, you're not going to see them either. So um, always, always, always treat a patient who's super itchy for flea allergy dermatitis just to be on the safe side. You do have to kill these little suckers in your house, though. And um, that's the thing a lot of people are not as excited to do um, because it means, you know, spraying chemicals in the home. Um, now, typically, if you are really diligent about flea control um, on the pet, it, it'll take a little longer, about four to six months sometimes, but you can usually get control of the fleas once you take away their ability to reproduce, which most of our flea products, uh, pl free flea prevention products have in them. Um, and so usually you'll get a handle on the flea population pretty quickly. 
Um, but, you know, sometimes you'll need to still have some uh, treatment happening in the house. Relax. Okay, I feel less itchy when I look at these guys because this is all under the microscope. Um, so mites, we're going to want to look for mites for an itchy patient. Um, uh, Sarcoptes is one that is incredibly itchy as well. Um, and let's kind of bring these back in here. So Sarcoptes in the upper right and uh, Scabies. Um, those are very, very itchy. Scabies is difficult to diagnose. You have to do a really deep... Um, skin scrape, you want to make sure you get capillary bleeding for a good sample on these guys. Um, and then Demodex is our follicular mite, lives in the follicle. Those are a little bit easier to diagnose, a little bit harder to treat. Scabies is hard to diagnose, but really easy to treat. Um, and so, but both of those can cause itching, although definitely worse itching with the scabies. Um, scabies is sort of zoonotic. People can definitely um, harbor scabies for a couple of weeks. They don't live very long on us, luckily. Um, and then down the bottom left, I mean, that's not uh, typically a uh, mite that's associated with lots of itchiness on the skin, but definitely itchiness in the ears, that otodecti cyanotis um, or ear mite. Um, that can cause a lot of itchiness in the ears. Don't forget um, sort of surface parasites. Uh, we can have uh, Chylitiella or walking dandruff, um, and we can diagnose that with a tape prep. We can have different types of biting and chewing lice um, that we can diagnose with a tape test. And then flea dirt. Um, don't forget to do a flea dirt test on an itchy animal. You want to uh, use a flea comb, comb some of that um, you know, little crusty stuff out, and then do this in front of the owners. Get that flea dirt wet and spread it in between two paper towels and you'll be able to see that digested blood turn kind of a, a reddish brown color and that to me that gets owners more often than anything um, is when they see that oh there's our cat yellow if you have patients that spend a lot of time outdoors um, if you uh, live in the south for sure, you'll see some fly bite dermatitis. Um, this can be really uh, damaging to pinna tips. Um, you can see in this cat has had some pretty serious trauma from fly strikes. Um, and this is from biting flies, not our standard house flies. Um, repellents can be useful, but you got to be careful with what's safe for our patients. And then very often you're going to be helping out with diagnostic tests like histology or biopsy and cytology. Um, very often, um, especially once you have been in practice for a little while, um, very often your uh, veterinarian may have you do the fine needle aspirate yourself. Um, and even maybe even look at it under the microscope yourself when you're getting used to seeing common dermatopathies and neoplasias and things like that. So that's another um, diagnostic test that we'll use. And oftentimes we can't diagnose what's going on with the skin without a biopsy. Um, or a fine needle aspirate. And um, so those are things that uh, we will do a lot of times with our patients. So to finish up here, we're going to talk about some metabolic disorders that lead to skin disease. So these are diseases of the system of the patient um, that lead to manifestations in the skin. So the way we're going to test for these is usually with a blood test. Um, and there's lots of different types of blood tests. It depends on what we're looking for. So it'll be specific to the disease that we're worried about. So let's talk about hypothyroidism first. This is probably the most common. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but Lola is zooming around the house meowing. So apologies. Um, <laughs> hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is 
Um, the most common endocrine disorder that we see in small animal clinical practice. Um, it is almost exclusively a dog disease. Um, it is not a cat disease. Um, cats tend to become hyperthyroid or have an overactive thyroid gland um, and don't often show a lot of classic skin issues with that. So um, we're talking about skin today, so we're going to talk about hypothyroidism. So what happens here, remember that thyroid gland is located on either side of the trachea in the neck and um, in a dog with hypothyroidism, their thyroid is not producing enough thyroxine or T4 hormone. The consequences of that is that our patient is going to oftentimes gain weight, be obese. Um, their heart rate may be lower than what is typical for a patient of their size. And they may experience thinning of their hair coat or loss of their hair coat. Um, they may have a bil bilaterally symmetrical hair loss, usually in the trunk. Uh, the head and the legs are typically spared, but the trunk and the tail are sometimes affected. You can see in this, this golden mix here has, has a pretty sad looking hair coat. Um, sometimes you'll just see uh, you know, kind of a dull, dry hair coat. And then what's really common in, in, in dogs that have been uncontrolled for a while is something we call a tragic expression. So these two labs have a tragic expression. You just look at them and they look sad. And I honestly have uh, made a presumptive diagnosis of hypothyroidism in several lab and golden patients when I walk in and I'm like, oh, because they just look sad. They look tragic. Um, and then we test their thyroid and we're like, lo and behold, this fat, sad lab has no T4. So um, the good news is we can treat this. Um, the way we diagnose it is by doing a thyroid panel, which is going to look at the thyroid level, the T4. Um, I also like to look at the TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone amount and the free T4. So that's a thyroid hormone that's not bound to proteins. And those will give us a more accurate diagnosis. Um, important for you guys as technicians to remember that when we do the serum test for the thyroid panel, we cannot use a uh, serum separator tube, a tiger top. We have to use a red top tube and just get regular serum. Um, the serum separator, for some reason, messes with the thyroid panel. Um, but we can treat these guys. Uh, there's a drug called levothyroxine, which is a synthetic form of the thyroxine that they normally would produce. Humans who have hypothyroidism go on the same exact drug, and uh, we dose it per their body weight. And uh, they basically stay on that for, for life. They do need regular rechecks. It's really, really important that these dogs come back for rechecks of their thyroid function um, to make sure that we're keeping up with the appropriate dose and not over or under dosing them. All right, the next one I want to talk about is hyperadrenocorticism. Um, this is also called Cushing's disease, which is way easier to say, but hyperadrenocorticism tells you what's going on. So hyper, too much, adreno, adrenal gland, corticism, adrenal cortex, and one of the hormones that is produced in the adrenal cortex is our friend cortisol. Everybody having flashbacks to uh, adrenal cortex information from anatomy last semester? Um, okay, so... What happens in hyperadrenocorticism or Cushing's disease is that our patients have an increased production of cortisol. And if you remember, cortisol is one of our glucocorticoids or steroid hormones. And essentially what you're going to get in these patients is a mimicking of too much oral steroid. So all those bad side effects I told you about with oral steroids and we have liver issues and you know your patient might um, be panting and gaining weight and PUPD. All that kind of stuff is going to happen with these guys. Um, so this is caused either by a tumor in the pituitary gland, which is going to be that releasing hormone. ACTH from the pituitary gland stimulates the adrenal cortex to release its hormones. So the pituitary gland may be causing it, or we could have a tumor on the adrenal gland itself, causing release of too much cortisol. It can also be caused iatrogenically. Iatrogenic means that we as the medical professionals have caused the problem 
And this can be caused by um, administration of long-term steroids. And so this is, you know, kind of pulling it full circle um, uh, with the negative possib possibilities for our patient. What we're going to see clinically is what you're seeing in this little Maltese here. Um, we're going to have patients who uh, physically will have thinning hair coat. Look at her little tail, little rat tail. Um, they're going to have a thinning hair coat or hair loss. Very often they will have a rounded um, pot-bellied appearance. Their skin will be thin and sometimes even have like little um, acne type lesions on it. Um, and then they're going to exhibit some other um, signs as well. I'm going to show you here in the next picture. Okay, so these patients will oftentimes have bilateral symmetrical alopecia, the thin skin, sometimes with acne, like I mentioned. They may have a pot-bellied appearance, this rounded, pendulous abdomen. And the reason for that is that too much cortisol does two things. It uh, reduces muscle mass, and so the muscles of the abdomen start to get a little bit thinner than they should be in order to hold all the abdominal organs where they should be. And it also increases fat deposition in the liver. And so the liver starts to get larger. So we have an enlarged liver plus thinner muscles in the abdomen. You get this big old pendulous belly. Um, these guys are very often PU, PD, and PP. So they're polyuric, urinating a lot. They're polydipsic, drinking a lot. And they're polyphagic, eating a lot. And sometimes they're obese, but they lose so much muscle mass that they actually start to get um, you know, muscle wasted along the dorsum, but they, they're kind of, they look round and pot-bellied otherwise. Um, these guys will also very often pant a lot, and that is one of the things that I've had clients bring their, their dogs in for, is excessive panting. And then we start to work them up and find out that they have Cushing's disease. Now, not every single Cushing's disease dog is going to have all of these clinical signs. Like this dog I could diagnose from across the room, um, which would be great if that happened all the time. But it doesn't. And sometimes it can be difficult to diagnose this condition. Diagnosis is there's a, a couple of different tests that we'll run. Um, and what we're usually measuring is cortisol levels in response to different types of stimulus. So we'll give them a medication that will that is supposed to stimulate cortisol release in a particular way and then we'll measure it before and after. It's kind of like a bile acids but without food. We're using um, other types of drugs to stimulate cortisol production. Um, and then the treatment, if we've caused it with our steroids, we're going to slowly back down the steroids and see if we can get the body's uh, normal cortisol pituitary axis back in place, um, those, those organs functioning normally. Um, but if it's a tumor in the pituitary or if it's a tumor in the adrenal gland, we have other types of treatments. Um, if it's the tumors in the pituitary, then we're going to use oral medications. And the medications have the potential for some serious side effects. So this disease takes a lot of client communication and education in order to treat them. Um, I won't go into the, the treatment too terribly long because it'll take it'll be another hour that I can talk about that. But um, in humans that have Cushing's disease, um, our pituitary gland is actually right, just right above, just dorsal to, I suppose, um, our hard and soft palate. And so in humans, they will actually go in surgically and take the tumor out. Um, but in dogs, the pituitary gland is way uh, in the you know caudal aspect of the skull. It's much more difficult to get to surgically. And so we only have medications to use. And like I said, these medications have some pretty serious side effects. So we have to be cautious with them. Um, if the tumor is in the adrenal gland, that makes surgery a little more possible. Um, a skilled surgeon can get in there and remove the adrenal gland um, if that's the owner's decision to do that. Um, we can also have autoimmune disease um, that manifests as skin disease. And so this, again, any autoimmune disease is when the uh, body's immune system decides that it needs to um, attack normal tissue. In uh, autoimmune skin disease, very often we'll have um, mucocutaneous junctions affected. So where you can see this nasal planum on the dog in the upper right. Um, but it can happen in other parts of the skin too. And 
typically the lesions we're going to see are vesicles, um, bulla, and ulcers, and then also crusting. And we treat these guys with pretty heavy doses of immunosuppressant drugs, oftentimes steroids, but other immunosuppressant drugs to help keep them under control. Um, so this is something we don't see this super commonly, um, but it is one of our rule outs, especially if I have lesions on the mucocutaneous junctions, the nose, um, around the lips, that sort of thing. All right, quickly, some other skin diseases. Um, perianal fistulas, these are very, very common in the German Shepherd dog. Um, you guys will notice that we have a lot of kind of German Shepherd dog specific diseases. These guys have a lot of concerns. Um, keep that in mind if you want one or if you have one. Um, but perianal fistulas, uh, if you look at the bottom picture, um, that is the dog's anus there on the right side of the lesion and then that big red open area is the fistula and that's a draining tract. Um, it leads from the outside of the, um, uh, the perianal region into the anus and it's as you can as assume it's quite painful. Um, it does often affect their ability to um, defecate comfortably. Um, they're pretty pretty traumatic. Um, what appears to be, we used to do surgery for these and kind of clean them up and close them up, but what, what's been discovered in the, in more recently is that this is an immuno, um, immunomodulated disease. So this is something that we can treat with immunosuppressants. This is an immune-mediated disease. And these guys respond really nicely to immunosuppressants. So that's a great thing. So this you know dog starts out with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and develops perianal fistulas later in life. Solar dermatitis, we don't see that a ton um, really anymore because a lot of our patients spend most of their time indoors, but animals that go outside a lot or especially animals with limited or no fur in areas or white fur, they can't really block the sun rays as well and they can get uh, a dermatitis also. The, knit, the nose, kind of the dorsal muzzle and the ears are the most common location for this to happen. Um, we see the concern for this is the development of cancer, just like too much sun exposure in humans without, um, you know, appropriate sunscreen or uh, enough melanin in the skin to absorb um, the, the sun's rays, we can see development of cancer. And typically, instead of melanoma in dogs and cats, we'll get squamous cell carcinoma, um, which is equally as terrible. Um, you can't put sunscreen on your animals. I don't necessarily recommend it if you're just, you know, taking a walk for just you know, a regular day, but if a patient spends a lot of time outdoors, it's something you can consider. Um, but again, sunscreen is formulated for human skin, not animal skin. Um, limited sun exposure is probably the best bet for these guys. And then in general, some skin treatments we're gonna do. So I've hinted at this a lot as we've been going on. So our antibiotics, antifungals, and steroids are typically gonna be on board in our patient for at least three weeks to give that basal cell layer a chance to get all the way up to the cornified skin layer um, and uh, get rid of the, the traumatized or damaged tissue. Um, the topical ointments and creams that we'll use are often gonna contain an antibiotic and anti antifungal and a steroid, which is just kind of covering all of our bases. Um, and really, we lean a lot on utilizing shampoos as our um, one of our mainstays of therapy. So there's lots of different types of shampoos. Um, on the screen here is Duzo, um, which is, there's like eight different ways to say that, but I, I heard from the company that we're supposed to say Duzo. Um, and this is one of my favorites. Uh, I really like this line of shampoos. Um, and they smell nice, which is always good. Uh, but it really doesn't matter which brand you use. That's going to be your veterinarian or your clinic um, choice. But the important thing is how to use them. So, and this is something that oftentimes you guys as technicians are going to be educating clients on how to utilize the shampoos. Because we don't do a lot of just regular shampooing at most veterinary hospitals unless there is a grooming uh, facility associated. 
So we're going to um, have a particular product that's prescribed by the veterinarian, and these are considered prescriptions, um, with the exception of the, like a maintenance shampoo. And depending on what's going on with the patient, if they have seborrhea, we need one type of shampoo. If they have a pyoderma, we need another type of shampoo. Um, and the uh, general rule of shampoo application is getting it nice and sudsy and letting it sit on the patient for 10 minutes. Um, it'll be the longest 10 minutes of this client's life. And I will tell them that too. I'll say it is a very long time. So set a timer on your phone, on a, you know, and watch whatever. Um, but don't, don't not time it <laughs> because you'll think it's time and it'll only have been two minutes that have passed. Um, so it's important to let that shampoo sit on the skin because it's the contact time that's the most important um, for the shampoo. And then once it's sat there, and I usually tell owners 15 minutes, assuming that they'll give up at 10. So I don't know. That's just a little communication tip from me to you. Um, and, you know, I commiserate with the owners. I say, you know what, this is going to be kind of crummy. You're not going to enjoy this. And neither is your dog or cat, heaven forbid. Um, and so, you know, make sure you have treats. Make sure you have a helper um, to keep them in the tub while you're waiting this 10 minutes. Um, you know, watch a little video on your phone. What did we do before cell phones, guys? I don't even know. Um, so, you know, kind of commiserate with your owner that they have to do this. Um, you want to make sure that the animal is completely rinsed. You want all of the shampoo off the skin once that 10 minutes is up. And then sometimes there'll be a follow-up conditioner depending on the particular type of um, shampoos you're using. Um, and there's all different kinds of shampoos. They're all um, utilized for particular issues. Um, you don't want to generally bathe the dog more than about once a month for maintenance. But when you use... Uh, medicated or prescription shampoos, oftentimes these owners are bathing their dogs sometimes two to three times a week, um, sometimes once a week. So again, commiserate, understand, tell them you know that this is kind of a bummer, um, but how important it is to uh, make sure that that patient is getting better. The other thing you want to talk to them about is the importance of rechecks. Um, it's super important for these owners to come back in two to three weeks to have their skin and ears rechecked because if they don't and it's not fixed yet, then we can't make the appropriate adjustments. The other thing I always tell owners, try to always tell owners when I'm dealing with skin or ears is that here's how it usually goes, but not all patients follow that plan. So usually this clears up in two to three weeks and yay, everybody goes on with their lives. But a lot of times it doesn't. So it's really important to have them come back in two to three weeks to have a recheck. If it's not improving, we need to make adjustments. And it's going to be better to make adjustments now than in three months when this is still a problem. And now the owner's really angry because what the doctor prescribed didn't work and it's our fault. So communication, communication, communication is super important um, when dealing with any kind of skin disease. Making sure that they um, know that they should call immediately if they have any questions. Um, you know, just making sure that owners feel like they're supported because they hate seeing their pets itchy. They hate seeing their pets uncomfortable. Um, they oftentimes are inconvenienced by the uh, treatments that we need to do. So we need to make sure that we reiterate to these owners that we understand that we want to help, but that it's a team effort <laughs> and uh, that they, they can get in touch with you anytime. So I went a whole hour on this, um, so I I apologize. I apologize for the length of this. Um, you don't have to watch it all at once, I suppose. I tell you that at the end. Um, but there you go. So next week we will start a new topic, and um, I think we're coming up on cardiovascular diseases, and we'll start incorporating some of our um, exotic information as we do that too. So. If you guys have questions, let me know. See you next Thursday. Bye-bye.